And so I thought what we'd do this morning is we'd try and test our knowledge with finish the worship lyric. Are you ready? I'll try it again. Are you ready? Right. Now, I'm probably not going to start this off in the right key or the right tune, so you may pick it up after me. All right. Let's make it a jet, not a ballad. Okay. So here we go. <clears throat> going to start off easy, right? And if you're new to church, new to faith, or if you don't know the songs, that's okay. Just enjoy us trying to get this right. Uh, Jesus loves me. Yes, I know, for the life tells me so. User, brilliant. How about that? Going to take a service off here. Uh, oh, what's the other one? Um, dead easy. Oh, deep and wide. You can know the old school Nazarenes because they've got the thing in. They're going for it. Amen. In Christ alone. I love the tone there. My, my hope is found, is it? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my, my song, this cornerstone. Ah, uh, you've got it, you've got it. There we go. Uh, here's a really old one, okay? And you may not remember this, but if you do, you have to clap along, okay? We're marching to Zion. We're marching upward to Zion, the beautiful city of God. What about this one? I love you, Lord. To worship you, O oh my soul, rejoice. Take joy, my King, in what you hear. Let it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. Come on, we'll pray. Lord, we thank you for the power of praise and worship. And so, Lord, this morning we turn to your word to see how praise is a holy habit. Lord, may the praises of your people be pleasing to you this morning. And Lord, would you teach us from your word how to praise and how to worship you, that it would become not a weekly thing, but Lord, a daily thing as we pour out our spiritual sacrifices to you. And in Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. So I want to begin with this scripture, church. Hebrews 13, verse 15. Oh, by the way, you th- I forgot about that. First to third year, you are excused. If you want to go off to uh, Connect Group, off you go and have a good time. Hebrews 13, uh, verse 15 says this. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to his name. In other words, church, the idea of praise and worship, particularly in the gathered gathering of God's people, the corporate gathering of God's people, is to be this continued outpouring of spiritual sacrifices in the aspect of praise and worship. And I love what the writer of Hebrews says. We're never sure if it's the Apostle Paul or the Apostle Peter. But he uses the word continual sacrifices. Which in the context of our series, church would tell us this. That praise and worship is a holy habit. Is praise and worship a holy habit in our lives this morning? And so what I want us to do, church, is to give us three short principles And how to make praise and worship a holy habit in our lives. If you're newer to this series that we've been doing over the last few weeks, we wrap it up next week. Uh, We've been looking at how we draw closer to Jesus and become more like him. And there's nothing like praise and worship that helps to form us into the image of the one we're worshipping. The object of our worship, the Lord Jesus Christ. So here's our first principle, and they all begin with P, because it wouldn't be a sermon if there wasn't alliteration. The first one is presence. Now here's what I want to do this morning through this first principle, church, is to give you a snapshot of the theology or the depth of what worship actually is. 
In Psalm 22, verse 3, it says this, Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. If you've been to prayer and worship night, you'll have heard me touching this before. But I love that scripture because when you look at it closely, church, it reveals the very theology, the very doctrine, what prayer and worship is, or what praise and worship is all about. Yet you are holy, enthroned on what? The praises of your people. Um, Could a couple of you guys mind lifting this throne that I brought especially for this morning? Is that okay? It's very heavy. Thank you. A couple of guys, just you, mate. Thank you. A throne. This is the closest thing to a throne I could find uh, at Lisburn Nazarene who, uh, who have lent it to us. Um, but church, this is really the theology of worship. It says, you are enthroned on the praises of your people. Now watch this carefully. What is a throne ultimately? It's a seat, right? That, that's, that's what a throne is. It's a seat. It's a chair. It's a place to come and sit and rest. And so what the psalmist tells us here, which unlocks our understanding of praise and worship church is this, is that when God's people praise and God's people worship with all that they have and all that they are, and I want to be specific, in the corporate gathering of God's people, it builds a throne for the presence of God to come and rest among us. That's the theology of worship. In a nutshell, it builds a throne in our gathering that the very presence of Jesus Christ himself through the power of the Holy Spirit comes and rests among us. I don't know about you, church, but I want to gather together and encounter the living God. See, and you know my heart here because we've been journeying together long enough, but... <clears throat> not all singing and not all praise is created equal. We can sing our hearts out in a service and yet not build a throne for the presence of the Lord to come. And yet we can praise and we can worship in such a way that God comes so close, it is a realization that, oh my goodness, God is in this place. Do you know what I'm talking about? And I have had moments here and in other gatherings throughout even our Christian lives, and I'm sure you've had too, where you have been in praise and you have been in worship with God's people. And it's one of those moments, and I know I've shared something like this before, but it's almost as if if I open my eyes, it's almost like Jesus will be standing right there. It's just his presence becomes so real when God's people praise. Why? Because where a throne is built, his presence comes. And so often what can happen in church is this. We can gather together and we can sing that we may not worship. We can come together and we could have great music and even a great word that we may not have praised. And that's why sometimes church, if, if, if we're being honest this morning just together, uh, it's why sometimes we can, we can leave church feeling or leave our gathering or leave our quiet time with God even on our own. We can leave going, that was good, but we, we didn't, quite hit it. There was just something missing. And oftentimes, church, it is because we may have sung, we may have opened the word, but we have not built a throne. We have not built a resting place within our hearts and within our corporate gathering where Jesus could come and say, I'm going to rest among these people this morning. Some of you may be familiar with that scripture in, in Genesis 28, where Jacob has a dream and he wakes up and he says, surely the presence of the Lord was in this place. And I did not know it. It's possible for us to gather and miss his presence. But church, on the flip side, there is a way for us to gather as God's people and to experience the very presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit among us this morning. And it comes and it flows through that place of heartfelt worship. I don't know about you, maybe you've been in some worship services <laughs> and uh, maybe the worship leader's gone. This is what heaven will be like, and you're going, I really hope not. <laughs> At least the angels will sing in tune. Do you know what I mean? You're going, please, no, Lord. And then there's moments where the Spirit of God breaks in. And sometimes the issue is, church, we treat the moments where God breaks in as the exception and not the rule. 
We treat those moments where we think to ourselves, oh my word, the Lord Jesus Christ is in this place this morning. As for special Sundays and not for every time we gather as the people of God. Surely when we gather, even if someone walks in maybe for the first time or, or maybe even someone who's, who's not a believer yet and they feel something different in the room. There's a church in New York called Brooklyn Tabernacle. Some of you may know of them. They, they, I don't know if they still do, but they used to have a very large choir. Phenomenal music and worship grounded in, in the presence of God. And the amount of stories that you would hear of people walking into that sanctuary on a Sunday morning and just bursting into tears. Not because the music was brilliant or the word was powerful, but because people understood Jesus Christ is in this room by the power of his Holy Spirit. We have the revelation of his presence through the Spirit of God today. And so what I want us to do in worship this morning, church, that's why I'm preaching first, is that we would have that fresh revelation, that fresh experience of the Holy Spirit moving among us. This morning, church, we are going to enthrone the Lord Jesus on our praises in this place. I don't know about you, but if we just have to go to church services until we die, it's going to get really boring. Or we can come here gathered as God's people, expectant to say, I'm here to meet with Jesus Christ this morning. Are we going to enthrone the Lord Jesus on our praises? And, and here's church is, is the difference between praise that, bring, that invites the presence of the Lord, I should say, that invites a throne to be built and praise that doesn't. There's two Hebrew words. One is called yad, okay? And yad literally means hands in Hebrew. And scripture would tell us that God wants our yad, right? In other words, he wants our external worship. He wants our voices. He wants knees bowed. He wants hands raised, or he wants hearts open to him. All sorts of different times and types of worship. Even um, some aspects of worship in scripture is even just described as, as laying prostrate before the Lord. All these different external types of worship. Maybe it's standing or sitting or whatever it might be. Your yad, your external expression of gratitude and love to the Lord. But then there's what's called your kabod. Your kabod is what means in Hebrew your glory or what means your full attention, all your heart. And to compare the two, I'm gonna use the illustration of if you're speaking, say if you're speaking to someone who you know you should be listening to, let's say your significant other okay and they're giving you instructions about what needs done around the house and you have given them your yad you're standing there and you're going uh-huh mm-hmm mm -hmm. and then chloe will go jordan you're not listening to me are you hmm <coughs> or when you're talking to someone and they're going yeah yeah <laughs> yeah 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 and you know in your head you're away with the birdies somewhere else You've given your yad, you're there physically, but you haven't given your kabod, you haven't given your full attention to the person. And church, the difference between praise that builds a throne for God's presence to come, we can all give our yad externally, that's brilliant, and, and so we should, it's God's preference. But the kabod church is within your heart, it's the glory, it's your full attention on him as we gather as God's people. And I'm a wee bit of an ADD worshiper, maybe you are too. You could be standing like this one moment, Lord, we love you, we bless your name. Did I leave the iron on, right? We've, we've all been there and we do it because we're human and, and our brains work overtime. But Kabod Church is continually bringing our minds back to the Lord and having all our focus on him when we sing and when we worship. And there's something when we do that with all of our hearts and Jesus is the one we long for. Jesus is the one we want to encounter and to praise and lift up his name, name above all names. His presence comes and it rests. And church, God doesn't want holy visitation at Carrick Nazarene. He wants holy habitation. He doesn't want every, every so often on a Sunday, oh, the Lord was there, wasn't that brilliant? He wants every time we gather for us to say, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. Do you know that song? Jesus, we enthrone you. We proclaim you are king. And then it goes on to say, And as we worship the throne, And as we worship, Come, Lord, and... 
This morning, church, in our praise and our worship, are we going to build a throne for Jesus to come and rest? And here's why that's important, church. This is the second principle. Prayer and worship in and of itself is our very purpose for being alive. It's the very purpose as to why we were created. In fact, I love Nathan Finocchio, who's a, a theologian, puts it like this, and I think he says it really well. The primary mission of the church is to worship God first and foremost. It's not just this. It's not education, it's not to evangelize, it's not to equip the saints, it's not to influence the world. All all these things are certainly part of the mission of the church. And we think of 1 Corinthians 10, uh, 31, and everything that you do, let it be to the glory of God. That's important. But they are not the first and primary mission of the church. This is where things have gone sideways for so many Christians and what continues to cause so much confusion around the church and its relationship to God. And so church, our very purpose for living and church, our very purpose for gathering here Sunday after Sunday on Sunday the 18th of February 2024 is to be praisers and worshippers unto God. It's the very reason why we were alive. It's something, and maybe you've had this feeling too. Maybe you've been in that moment of worship, singing to the Lord and with all God's people. And it's almost like this feeling of, of even though life may not feel very complete or whole, but you feel complete in that moment because you're doing exactly what you were born to do. And that is to worship him first and foremost. Some of you will know the Westminster Catechism, which is just a doctrinal statement that underpins so, many, so much theology of churches today. It says, what is man's chief end? To glorify him and enjoy him forever. To glorify him and enjoy him forever. I love what Wayne Gruden says. He's a, a well, again, another well-known theologian. He writes this, worship in the church is not merely a preparation for something else. It is in itself the fulfilling of the major purpose of the church with reference to its Lord. Because here's the thing, church, in our purpose of worshiping him, Jesus is always worthy of our praise and worship. Always. Some of you know the story, I've, I've told it a couple of times now, but if you're newer, it paints the picture. Uh, my mum and dad, we got it from you sharing this actually, but my mum and dad uh, were part of a singing group uh, called um, Shalom, which lets you know the era that it was in. And uh, Shalom uh, would, have, would have sang around some churches in the evening and stuff, um, as used to happen in those days. And um, <laughs> uh, there, was one, there was one Sunday night, they were in their home church and their pastor came up to them and says, look guys, during the service, would you like sing and do a wee bit of what they would call ministry or ministry piece? Um, and they went, oh, look, really appreciate that. We're, we're just, we're really tired and we, we don't really feel like it tonight. And the pastor looked at them, and he was well known for this, but he said, you don't feel like it? Isn't it as well when the Lord Jesus was on his way to Calvary, he didn't say, I don't feel like it? Church, we worship God and we will worship and praise him no matter what is going on in our lives because he is worthy of our worship even when we don't feel like it. We bring what scripture calls the sacrifice of praise because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ, the son of God, went to Calvary. He takes on the sins of the world through his once and for all sacrifice that takes all of our sin away and for those who believe in him, give him a new life today and a hope for the future of eternal life. That is a God worth praising regardless of our emotions, regardless of our circumstances, the name of Jesus is worthy to be praised. And there's something, church, that even if life is not going the way you intended it to this morning, that when we worship and we lift up our voices to the Lord, like David said, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. There's something about that that builds a throne for his presence to come and rest. And let me touch on that presence briefly. In scripture, we find two types of presence. There's omnipresence, God being everywhere throughout the earth at all times and all places. And then there's what scripture calls manifest presence or special presence or what Hebrew would call the Shekinah. And it's that idea we were talking about church. Manifest presence, Shekinah presence is that sense of, oh my goodness, God is in this room. That's the kind of worship that we want church that builds a throne where the manifest presence of God, the living God, is known among us in a tangible way. And we don't want that every so often. Oh, church, we want it every time we gather. We want it on us through our Monday to our Friday. And here's our final principle, church, is this. 
Worship is about his presence. It fulfills our purpose. And finally, here's your part to play this morning. We're all priests. Now, here's a bit of news for you. And if you're new to faith, I will explain this in the scripture. But guess what? You're joining the priesthood this morning. If you're single, don't freak out. I'll explain it in a second. But you're joining the priesthood this morning. Each and every one of us are called to be priests in the Lord's presence. And I'll explain what that means. The Apostle Paul writes this in uh, 1 Peter 2 and 5. Or sorry, Peter writes this in 1 Peter 2 and 5. Uh, and you are living stones that God is building into his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy, what? Priests. Through the meditation of Jesus, you offer spiritual sacrifices, often that's our worship, that pleases God. For you are a chosen people. You are royal, what? Priests. A holy nation. God's very own possession. And church, what do priests do? Quickly, in the Old Testament, priests would come, they would worship God, they would make sacrifices of, of typically animals as a way to praise and to worship the name of God. But today, you and I are priests who do not make those kind of sacrifices, but we make sacrifices, what Paul calls the fruit of our lips, our praises, our worship, and our lives as living sacrifices. You and I are priests this morning. And so when we gather as a church, here's what we need to realize, folks. We're on duty. Do you get what I'm saying? We are on duty. And part of the issue in, in, in Christianity in the West, some would say in some parts, is because our society has become so consumerist and so individualistic that we are no longer priests, but we can easily become passive consumers. And church becomes about what I can get and not what I can give. And worship becomes about, well, was the set list what I wanted or was it actually was I here to worship and leave a sacrifice to the Lord? We are priests, not passive consumers. And you'll know if you're living from a place of priesthood, serving before God and worshiping him, or a passive consumer through your posture of your heart, posture of your heart. For example, the passive consumer, the posture of the heart will be this. Better be the songs I like today. When are we going to sing a hymn? When are we going to sing a new song? <sighs> Phil Wickham again. And a priest says, I don't care what song it is, I'm here to leave a spiritual sacrifice to the Lord this morning. A passive consumer says, Pastor, better give me a life changing word today. He said a few bad ones in the bounce here. You're not meant to laugh at that bit. <laughs> or we come to say, Lord, the posture is this. I don't care who's preaching or what the text is or what the series is. I'm here to receive a word from you and go out and live it. Church, are we passive consumers in the house of God or have we come to be priests and to worship him and to lift up his name, the name above all names? Church, you and I will not hold back our gifts. We will not hold back our sacrifices as we gather, but rather, church, we will leave them on the altar and be priests before God. Consumers say, passive consumers, church say, what can I get from church today? Priests say, Lord Jesus, what can I give you and your people this morning? Oh, it's a big difference, the posture of your heart. Are we passive consumers or are we going to take the opportunity this morning to be priests in the presence of God himself? Do you know that, you know that song? Um, <laughs> uh, we bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Terrib My opinion, terrible song. Just let's not do it again. We've had that era. Brilliant theology though. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord, not our opinions, not our preferences, not how we want it to be done. We bring our sacrifices, our worship and our praise to a holy God in the presence of his name. We bring the sacrifice of praise. We bring our yad and we bring our kabod, all that we are. It was a brilliant, I remember one day in church uh, going out, a mate of mine was a, was a worship leader at the time and um, he was standing at the door and somebody said, Somebody said to him on the way out after, after the service, they were like, didn't really like your set list today. And he goes, that's okay, but we're singing to you. 
But really, it's about him. It's always been about him. And it will always be about him. And when we lift up our voices and we praise and we worship, his presence comes and it rests. Church, we don't want this to be a place of music and song. We want to be the very place of his presence.